All right, hello and welcome back. It's your boy Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers. And today we are going through the brim uh, room on the sock level one uh, pathway inside Try Hack Me. The brim room is a subscribers only room, which means that you need a Try Hack Me subscription to go through it. And it's only 12 bucks to get the subscription. But if you use the link in the description below, you will get an extra $5 towards your membership and it'll make it even more affordable to get along with us and start hacking and start learning and doing all those great things. Of course, you don't have to do that. You're more than welcome to just download Brim on your own computer and go through all the exercises together. All you would need is probably just a couple of exercise files. Uh, which is available in a lot of different places, GitHub and things like that. So if you want to just follow along and follow along in the videos, of course, you're more than welcome to do that. Just make sure that you like, subscribe, and turn on the notification bell so that you get notified the next time a video comes out and you'll just be able to tag along and enjoy with us. So without further ado, we are going to go into the introduction of the room. All right, so Brim is an open source desktop application. So it has a GUI from what we can tell. And um, it processes PCAP files and log files. So it's basically everything that we've been doing, except now we don't have to do it in a command line interface. Uh, the primary focus is search and analytics. Uh, we're gonna learn how to use it, how to process files, investigate files, yada, yada, yada. Um, we should have a basic understanding of network fundamentals and to kind of understand how the Zeek room works. So we just finished doing the Zeek modules. So if you haven't seen them, go watch those videos as well. Uh, network fundamentals is just something that's super basic. I don't think I've done, and I don't know if I have actually, I should verify if I have or not, but I don't think I've done a network fundamentals room or at least the recording of the room. I've done the actual exercises in TriHack Me. I just haven't recorded it. So if you go there, it might even be a free room that's available. At yeah, there's a couple of free rooms and then there's a couple of VIP rooms. So the OSI model, but then you can always find videos on the OSI model and what packets and frames are and extending the network and firewalls and stuff like that. So this is just, again, the basics, the network fundamental. Um, and it's always good to do. I think I might just do it anyways, just to have the video up for everybody to have access to later. And then we can kind of refer back to it in future videos because they keep talking about that network fundamentals room for pretty much everything that we do. So I think I'm just going to do a video on that just to make sure you guys have access to it. So a VM, a virtual machine is access, is attached to this room. You don't need SSH or RDP or anything like that. And this is the virtual machine that has already been started up for us. So we're going to jump into that in a little bit. And process some PCAP files and see what we can find. So what is Brim? Let's try to find that out. It's an open source desktop app that processes PCAP files and with a primary focus on providing search and analytics. It uses the Zeek log processing format. It also supports Zeek signatures and Suricata rules for detection. It can handle two types of data as input, which is PCAP packet capture uh, PCAP files created with TCP dump, T Shark, Wireshark, etc., and then log files, structured log files like Zeek logs. Um, Brim is built on an open source platform. So, Zeek, the Z language, ZNG, data format, and Electron and React. And uh, it's, uh, I mean, apparently, uh, PCAP files bigger than one gigabyte are cumbersome for Wireshark and processing big PCAPs with TCP dump and Zeek is efficient, but requires time and effort because it's literally just a bunch of data that's dumped into the screen and you have to try to decipher it. And it's not really organized very well. So if you don't know certain search filters or how to sift through all that raw data, it does become pretty cumbersome, as they say. Um, Brim reduces the time and effort spent processing PCAP files and investigating the log files by provo providing a simple and powerful GUI. And we love a good GUI. Uh, Brim versus Wireshark versus Zeek. So this is kind of what it looks like, right? So Brim has PCAP processing, event stream and log investigation. Wireshark sniffs traffic, PCAP processing, packet and stream investigation. 
uh, P, uh, Zeek does PCAP processing, event, stream, and log investigation. So is there a GUI? Zeek doesn't have one. Is there sniffing? Uh, Brim doesn't have one. Uh, log processing, Wireshark doesn't have it. Packet decoding, Brim doesn't have it. <laughs> so you could just kind of analyze and see what all the different features are that who does have and who doesn't have, so on and so forth. And uh, it just says the ease of management is four out of five for Wireshark and Brim because obviously they have GUIs and Zeek isn't, uh, but it has, you know, it has great or good performance compared to these two guys right here because it is pretty robust when it comes down to analyzing PCAP and uh, log files and stuff like that. Um, and it's pretty quick. That's the thing. It's like it works very quickly in comparison. I haven't used Brim, so we'll, we're about to find out how good it is. But uh, in comparison, based on what TriHackMe is telling us, you know, these are, these are the pros and cons of these things. So... Let's actually jump into it and see what the whole thing is and how it works and what it does. The basics. Uh, I'm going to start Brim up while we're going to read this thing right here. So this is basically what the interface looks like. So this seems to be pretty interesting, actually. Um, so there's pools, queries, and history. So pools and log details. So, you know, you open the PCAP and that's what the name is right here. The pool is a bunch of PCAPs, I'm guessing, that show up all together. You have the date from two. This is actually very cool. I like this interface a lot. Um, the fields that are available for each one. So if you click on it, it'll show you what all the different fields are that are related to that particular packet. And you can, I'm sure, just go through it uh, in more detail. Uh, you have a timeline that provides information about start and end dates, there's information fields, you can hover over fields and have more details on the field. The above image shows a user hovering over Zeke's con file, con.log and uh, UID value. Uh, this information will help you in creating custom queries. The rest of the log details are shown in the right pane and provides details of the log file fields. Note that you can always export the results by using the export function located near the timeline. So this is when you go through the UID string right here. This is all the information that comes. And each one of these, I guess, could be a bunch of different things. So you have the con log file, then there's the DNS log file, then you have a sys log file, so on and so forth. So it's a lot of great stuff. Uh, you can correlate each entry by reviewing the correlation section at the log details pane shown on the left image. This section provides information on the source and destination addresses, duration, and associated logs. Uh, the quick information helps you answer where to look next and to find the event of interest. There's filtering values, counting fields, sorting A through Z, Z through A, viewing details, performing who is lookup on an IP address, viewing the associated packets in Wireshark, I mean, this thing's pretty cool. So far, it seems pretty useful. So we'll see what, what the issue is. Uh, so this is what it looks like. So we would download packets. Yeah, so I mean, this is, oh, this is Wireshark. What am I saying? So this is Wireshark. Uh, so you would download a packet from Wireshark. And then who was lookup and virus total lookup are, I guess, external links that will actually go into it and tell you who is and what uh, if there's anything associated to virus total for it. And then there are the queries. So we can browse through queries, load a specific one. Uh, they have names, tags, and descriptions. Query library lists the query names. And uh, once you double click it, it passes the actual query to the search bar. You can double click on the query and execute it with ease. Once you double click on the query, the actual query appears on the search bar and is listed under the history. The results are shown under the search bar. In this case, we listed all available log sources created by Brim. In this example, we only insert a PCAP file and it automatically creates nine types of Zeek log files. Uh, Brim has 12 pre-made queries listed. Uh, these queries help us discover the Brim query structure, etc., etc. So process the sample PCAP and look at the details of the first DNS log 
that appears on the dashboard. What is the Q class name? So, okay, let's do it. Let's, let's click on a thing right here. We're going to go to desktop, exercise files, and we want, which one? Sample PCAP. We're going to load this thing. And let's see what we get over here. Okay, so here we go. The sample PCAP just loaded. And what is it? What is the, look at the details of the first DNS log and what is the Q class name? So the first DNS log is this thing. And what do we want? We want the Q class name. So when you hover over it, it literally tells you. So the Q class name in this case is C underscore internet. I wonder if I can copy this. I think I can copy it. So let's see if we could paste it here. Oh, we can paste it. And that should be correct. It is correct. Look at the details of the first NTP log. And what is the duration value? So we're going to go back here and just scroll to the left. The first NTP log is this thing. And we're looking for the duration value. Okay, so we had to right click on it and open the details. And when you do that, there is a correlation section right at the bottom right here that gives you the duration, which is 0 0.005 seconds. So if I go here and do 0 0.005, that would be the answer. And so look at the details of the stats packet log that is visible on the dashboard. What is the reSM TCP size? So the stats packet log that's visible on the dashboard. Let's see if we can find that. So this is the stats packet log. I believe that they're referring to, I was looking for something complete. I was looking in a bunch of different places and it's literally right here. And so it's asking what is the reSM TCP size? So which, let's see if we can find that. I think if we also just do open details, it should be a little bit easier to find it. reSM TCP size, yeah, it's right here. So reSM TCP size, TCP size is 540. There we go. That <laughs> that last one threw me for a loop. I was like, what am, what am I missing here? What am I not noticing? Okay, cool. Moving on to default queries. All right. So uh, there, are, there are 12 pre-made queries. Uh, reviewing the overall activity would be activity overview. Um, Windows-specific networking activity would be the windows networking activity um, and it shows things like smb enumeration logins and services um, then there is unique network connections and transfer data which basically looks like this i mean there's seems to be a lot of stuff in here we're definitely not going to get this in like one glance okay so if it seems overwhelming i don't want you to freak out we just need to know where what the basics are and where things exist. Then there's DNS and HTTP methods, which is going to look like this. So unique DNS queries will bring that up for you, as well as when you do that, it opens up the actual path, you know, or excuse me, it, it fills in the query. So instead of you having to type this whole thing in, you just click on it and it'll start searching for a lot of these things for you. And then there is file activity. So you click on it, the query fills in, and it shows you the types of files. Look at that. It has the MD5 hash value file name. If you did the Zeek room with me, you can really appreciate how easy this is compared to sorting and sifting through a Zeek log file to try to find this information. It's actually pretty freaking amazing, honestly. This is like super useful. Um, then we have uh, the show IP requests, so IP subnet statistics and all of that stuff associated with that. Then there is Suricata, and so you alerts by category, by source, by subnet, so on and so forth. So pretty cool, pretty good stuff. So now we're going to investigate the file. What is the name of the detected GIF file? So let's see. Okay, yeah, there is a task four sample pcap so let's open that up because when i went through the the first sample pcap there were no files there are no file and i'll here i'll show you because i kind of i'm pretty sure i'm going to edit that out so when you load the sample pcap and we'll wait for it to load real quick 
and here's the sample PCAP and then we just go right here and we click on file activity and it says no results so which means we have to go here and we're going to open a new one I can I can just do this click that choose a file and we're going to use the one for exercise four for task four and so we're going to give that a second to load and then we'll come back and try to find the file that they're talking about all right cool here we go we got this so now we're going to click on file activity and there it is and so it wants the what is it the gif file so it is <laughs> cat01 with hidden text that's the name so boom submit and that's it investigate the con log file what is the number of the city names identified city names and there are several con log files so what do we want here let's see what the hint says you can filter the con log file and then view the available sections by scrolling the horizontal bar path con cut country code etc so i'm just going to take this little piece of uh, query that they gave us and i'm going to paste it in here to see if it's going to give me anything but it's going to be on I'll just do on this con log file and see what this says. Can I paste in here? I can paste in there. Press enter. What is the number of the identified city names? So we got one city, two cities. Let's try two. That's the right answer. <laughs> um, investigate the Suricata alerts. What is the signature ID? of the alert category potential corporate policy violation. So Suricata alerts, we're gonna go down here. Suricata alerts by category, by subnet, by source. And it wants the signature ID of the alert category potential corporate policy. So Suricata alerts by category. Okay, so it's actually a lot simpler than I thought it was. So we're gonna click on the first Suricata alert and then it shows us the uh, query at the top right here and so we all we got to do is just delete this whole thing because those are all the extra options and parameters and so when you do that it just shows you the alert right so event type alert and so if we just scroll to the right then we'll see that it says alert category potential corporate policy corporate policy violation and then right there there's something called a signature id and so we can copy this and this is going to be our answer. And uh, when I pasted it, it pasted it without the commas and that gave me a wrong answer notification. So make sure that you use commas when you try to submit your answer because the commas apparently are important. Okay, so there we go. We finished the default queries section. And so let's move on to use cases. So use cases have a bunch of different, I mean, I'm not going to read through all this because this is a lot of stuff, but I will read through the purpose of them and what they're supposed to be for. So the purpose would be, so a basic search, you can search for any string or value. So files and logs containing any value, you basically just type that in and that's it, right? Logical operators or and not. So 192 and NTP. Filter values. Filter name equals the value. So filter name would be this equals the value, which would be that. So ID original originating host, host, you should be familiar with that if you saw the Zeke videos. And this is what I understand now why they say that you need to know about Zeke queries and Zeke uh, processing and so on and so forth, because a lot of this is from Zeke. So uh, list the specific log file contents. And so the path would be log name. So con, for example, uh, count field values, count by this, uh, sort findings, uh, cut specific field from a log file. And that's very similar to Zeek cut, uh, list unique values. Then you have, uh, it's highly, so the note right here is, it's highly suggested to use field names and filtering options and not rely on the blind irregular search function. Brim provides a great indexing of log sources, but it is not performing well in irregular search queries. 
the best practice is always to use the field filters to search for the event of interest. So the fields that you're looking for. So the originating ID, uh, originating host, excuse me, responding host, etc. So communicated hosts is one. Frequently communicated hosts is another one. The most active ports is one. Long connections. So you're going by the duration, transfer data, the DNS and HTTP queries, suspicious host names, uh, suspicious IP addresses, detected files, SMB server message block activity, and known patterns. So these are just useful to know. And uh, what do I zoom out? There we go. So these are very, very useful to know. It's another one of those cheat sheets. There was one inside the Zeek room as well, the initial Zeek room that we went into, not the exercise room. And there was like a, they called it Kung Fu, like command line Kung Fu, something like that. So this is very, very useful. This is just basically pre-made queries that you can modify and use and kind of sample so that you can create your own and learn how to search within Brim. And it's very, very useful. So let's move into the first exercise here. So threat hunting with Brim, malware C2, which is command and control detection. So uh, malware campaign spread with Cobalt Strike. We know an employee clicked on a link, downloaded the file, and then the network speed issues and anomalous activity arises. Now open Brim, import the sample PCAP, and go through the walkthrough. Let's investigate the traffic sample to detect malicious C2 activities. And so we're first going to look at uh, whatever, and we're going to query this. And so this, I'm guessing, let me just make sure that exercise task six. So we got to close this out and go over here, and we're going to open up task six, because I'm pretty sure it has its own set of files, and it does. Look at that. So from here, we are going to import this little query just to see what information we can find and what are the questions we got to answer. So it says, what's the name of the file downloaded from Cobalt Strike C2 connection? What is the number of Cobalt Strike connections using port 443? And there is an additional C2 channel uh, used in the used given case. What is the name of the secondary C2 channel? So we're looking for a few things. Hint right here, the IP starting with 104 is Cobalt Strike and the event type alert, so on and so forth. This is going to be potentially our other query. So the first query is this thing. And it's supposed to say, let's look at a let's look at the available log files to see what kind of data artifact we could have. The image on the left shows that we have many alternative log files we could rely on. And we could look at the frequently communicated host before starting to investigate logs. So we already know that the, the one that starts with 104 is probably Cobalt Strike. And there is, I mean, a bunch of IP addresses, but there is one right here that starts with 104. So this thing could potentially be Cobalt Strike. And it doesn't seem to be... No, there's a bunch that are cobalt that start with 104. So that doesn't tell us much. So it does say that these are the the um, the frequently communicated hosts, but it really doesn't tell us much. If we do the the count is already coming from the very very top right here. So this one's missing. I don't know who that is, but then right after that is you know 434, 150, etc. So by far, this is the most communicated. And then let's see what happens with the rest of them. So this query provides sufficient data that helped us decide where to focus. The IP address 1022XX and 104.168 draw attention in the first place. So 1022, which is right here, and 104, that's another one, uh, draw attention. And let's look at the port numbers and available services before focusing on the, the rest of the stuff. So we're gonna do this now going to copy this thing and go here and going to paste that. Okay, there we go. Now we have our port numbers by count. So 443, um, 184, etc. So that's the number of counts. And then so port 443, 
which uh, is SSL or HTTPS, uh, gets 367. Uh, DNS, which is 53, gets 184, so on and so forth, right? So uh, 443 has gotten a lot of activity, though. It's showing up a lot. So let's see what else is going on here. Let's see the image, and it shows us right here. So uh, nothing extremely odd in ports, but there's a massive DNS record available. Let's have a closer look. So now we're going to search for DNS and see what we can find in DNS. So close that and replace that with the new query. Okay, so this is all the stuff that shows up for DNS. So hashing old dot top, whatever, whatever, whatever. Is there anything that shows up kind of funky? Well, the most one is hashing old dot top. Let's see what the exercise says. So it says, obviously there's that. So there are, uh, there are out of ordinary DNS queries. Let's enrich our findings by using virus total to identify possible malicious domains. So they literally did a search for the very first domain and it says 13 security vendors found a uh, flag this domain as malicious. And uh, the detections were virus total. And then these are the IP addresses that were connected to it. And then there's another one, which is the, where is the other one right here that said right here. So old make it hap dot top. I guess it's the dot top domain. Maybe that seems to be kind of fishy. So old, uh, old make it hap dot top also showed up as a malicious domain. So we've detected two additional malicious IP addresses and 45147 from the log files and gathered 68138 and 18570 from virus total linked with suspicious DNS queries with the help of external source. So let's look at HTTP requests before narrowing down our investigation with the found malicious IP addresses. So now we're gonna go through here and we're going to use the HTTP request to try to narrow down the search. Let's see what we can narrow it down to. Okay, so there is one thing that stands out immediately, which is the 104 the IP has downloaded something called 4564EXC. And is this one of the questions right here? Yeah, 4564.EXC is that answer. So what's the name of the file downloaded from Cobalt Strike? Now, what is the number of Cobalt Strike connections using port 443? So let's see if that'll show up in our search altogether. So if it's using this domain or if it's using this uh, IP address, that's starting with this thing right here. So we can definitely just search for that, right? So responding host equals, that would basically be it, right? So if we go to responding, post equals 104.168.44.45 because that's basically it. So value ID, RSP host, right? Let me see if that even shows up. So that's not how I'm supposed to search for it. So let's go back to our search filters in the last task real quick, which is right here. So we want to find ID originate. So I need to put ID dot RESP host, and then I can do probably and uh, RESP port would be that. So we'll do this. So we're going to do ID dot, and let's see what shows up. Bunch of stuff. Look at that. So bunch of stuff from this person. <laughs> and uh, what was the other one? ID dot RESP port equals 443. And there's a bunch of stuff right here. And so now we could do uh, WC dot L. Maybe if that would work. Okay, that did not work. Let me try to see if I can get some more information here. So we got this far and we did uh, this piece right here that said uh, we've detected that. Da, da, da. Let's look at HTTP request before downloading. And it showed us right here. So 104 downloaded that file 
And so we detect a file download and request uh, from the IP address we assumed is malicious. Let's validate this and validate our hypothesis. Hypothesis. And so we found it, right? So we went to the IP address search on virus total, and we actually found out that it is indeed a malicious thing. And there is 51 out of 69 uh, platforms founded malicious. It's a Win32 EXE. So it is definitely something that can be wrong. And so it's a Trojan cobalt strike, as it says in the name. So VirusTotal says that 104 da, 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 is linked with a file. Once we investigate that file, we'll discover that these two findings are associated with Cobalt Strike. Up to here, we found the abnormal activity and found the malicious IP addresses. Our findings represent the C2 communication. Now let's conclude the hunt by gathering low-hanging fruit with Suricata logs. So we want this particular event type alert type situation to show up. So I'm going to delete this thing and I'm going to use the event type alert. And let's see what we can find in here. So we got this. So unknown traffic 329 potential corporate bias policy violation two, miscellaneous two, targeted malicious activity three, network Trojan six, potentially bad traffic 35, Suspicious activity, 38. Unknown traffic, 329. So pretty bad, pretty bad stuff. And it shows it right here too. So now we can see the overall malicious activity by Suricata. Note that you can investigate the rest of the IP addresses to identify the secondary C2 traffic anomaly without using the Suricata logs. This task demonstrates two different approaches to detecting anomalies. So investigating each alarm category and signature to enhance threat hunting and post hunting system hardening is suggested. Please note adversaries using Cobalt Strike are usually skilled threats and don't rely on a single C2 channel. Common experience and use cases recommend digging and keeping the investigation by looking at additional C2 channels. This concludes our hunt. Now repeat this exercise in the attached VM and answer the questions below. So what is the number of Cobalt Strike connections using port 443? And we got, what was the hint again? Uh, IP starting with 104 is Cobalt, Cobalt Strike. So we just need to find the number connecting with uh, port 443. That's specifically what we're looking for. Oh man, this entire time everything's been thrown up because I didn't use a underscore and I used a dash. Could you? Can you believe that crap? Oh my gosh. Okay, so <laughs> so here's the actual command. You need to have an underscore at the beginning of this. Goodness gracious, underscore path equals equals con. So we're looking through the con connect and log, connection log. This is the malicious IP that we're searching for. And we want to cut the responding port, which is uh, what the specific port that we wanted to look for, which is 443, and then the responding host. So we're going to look for both of those. We're going to cut both of those. We're going to sort it, and we're going to count the unique uh, instances that show up for that. And so the count is going to be 328. And we're going to go right here and we're going to do 328. Thank you so much. Okay, so now there's an additional C2 channel uh, in the use given case. What is the name of the secondary C2 channel? So we need to find that. So uh, in this particular case, maybe this actual command will work for us. Hopefully it will. Um, let's see if we can go and find anything good over here. So when we ran the uh, virus total or when they ran the virus total uh, search earlier for us and they found that it was a win 32 exe right here. Um, under relations, it is potentially possible that this thing right here, which is a Win32 thing, this ICE ID request cookie, that could be one. And it could also be the Drydex, because I've actually heard of Drydex before as well. And it shows up under the abuse.ch database. So it could be a couple of these things right here. 
so let's try dry decks and then we will do what was the other one iced id so dry decks and iced id so dry decks that's not it so iced id that's it cool so there we go we got the answer to those and now we're going to move on to task number seven uh, which is going to be threat hunting for crypto mining is what we're going to be looking for here all right so here we go uh, we're just going to follow along with these uh, instructions and try to hopefully find as much as we can uh, with the basic instructions that they give us and then we will have to probably come up with our own queries and our own commands and stuff like that so uh, this particular case is a crypto mining scenario and we're just going to go through the traffic and try to investigate some traffic. I already loaded the the file. So there we go. We already have task seven crypto mine loaded. So let's search inside here and see what this brings up for us. OK, so here we go. So there is um, this missing thing right here that has 948 counts. And then a lot of these things are just four. Um, the ports might be kind of interesting so there's port 80 and then there's 6666 this seems to be kind of suspicious here and we have 8080 which is usually a web server more 6666 there's 8888 um yeah so the port seems kind of fishy so let's see what they're saying over here uh so the query provided sufficient data that helped us decide where to focus the ip address 192168 draws attention in the first place. Let's look at the port numbers and available services before focusing on suspicious IP address and narrowing down. So 192.168, why is that? Oh, because it's literally, look at this, it's all of them. It's all of them, holy shit. So I'm looking at the port when all of these things are generated by one freaking IP address. Okay, well that's, yeah totally missed that that went way over my head okay so now we're going to use this command to try to see what ports are fishy and here we go so we got 3333 all these things this resembles metasploit activity in my experience because we used to do stuff like that all the time so there's a multiple weird port usage and it is not usual. We are one step closer. Let's look at the transfer data bytes to support our findings. By the way, what questions are we answering here? So how many connections use port 1999, 99, 66, 66? Let's see, can we find that right now? Because I did see 66, 66 here. Okay, so let's see what was the other piece right here. So now we want to find... Um, we want to look at the transfer data bytes. There we go. To support our findings and find more indicators. So the transfer data bytes are going to be done using this very long command, which is for finding the connections of this thing. So let's see. We're going to copy this entire query here. Okay, so transferred bytes, total bytes 36,000 on this thing, of course, the responding host originating ports 9171, uh, originating bytes. Okay, let's see how they've analyzed this. The query result proves massive traffic originating from this suspicious IP. The detected IP is suspicious. However, we don't have many supportive log files to correlate our findings and detect accompanying activities at this point we will hunt the low-hanging fruits with the help of suricata rules so let's investigate using this particular rule which is sort count uh, so it's obviously it's more than sort count but <laughs> It's this whole shebang. So event type is an alert and alert severity and alert category is what we're looking for. So potential corporate privacy violation and cryptocurrency mining activity detected. 944 cryptocurrency mining activities detected. 
Okay, that's pretty in your face. So the alert tell us that we're investigating crypto mining, uh, currency, cryptocurrency mining. And if we dig deeper, we discover which data pool is used for the mining activity. First, we will list the associated connection logs with this suspicious IP, and then we will run a virus total search against the destination, destination IP. So it's going to be this just to run against that suspicious IP address. And here it is. And based on the image, it has told us a very many things for the responding ID. It seems to be, yeah, there you go. There's several instances, you know, 9999, all these guys right here that we're trying to find out uh, what it is. And 6666. There was a question that was associated with that. So it says, name of the service used by port 6666. Can we find that real quick right here? If we just scroll all the way to the side. No, unfortunately I cannot. It is running in Singapore though. Does it ask us that? No, it doesn't. <laughs> okay, so uh, we found some interesting information, all right? And so if they run that IP address, the 103.362.64, it does show that it has been flagged by two security vendors. This is their domain name and Nanopool, Nanopool, etc. So we find that uh, there's a mining server. In real life cases, you may need to investigate multiple IP address to find the event of interest. Now let's use Suricata logs to discover mapped out miter attack techniques. Wow, look at that. That is pretty amazing that that exists. So we're gonna go do this, I'm gonna copy this, and we're going to paste our code in here. Hopefully you can't hear the sirens in the background because apparently somebody's killing somebody or somebody's jacking somebody or somebody's just dying for the hell of it. <laughs> so that's not funny. I'm not laughing at that. It's just, there's shit going on all the time, man. It's, it's pretty crazy. So, okay. So mining activity, resource hijacking, T1496. That's the technique ID and the impact is, uh, the tactic name is impact. Okay. So it says the same that we just noticed. So we can identify the mapped out miter attack details as shown below. Cryptocurrency mining, resource hijacking, etc., etc. So now repeat this exercise and ask, answer the questions below. So how many connections used port 1999? So we're going to use the connection uh, received data query as our base query to modify. And we're going to change a few things after this cut data right here, just to be able to find what we actually need to find. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to add ID dot res, res, eh, uh, responding port, and then we're going to sort it. And we're going to look for all the unique ones, which is 1999, one more nine, four nines, I think, right? Four nines. Yeah. And so let's see if that actually works. Okay, so there you go, 22 counts, a uh, unique count. This is the thing that helps us greatly. So 22 counts of that IP showing up and that should be hopefully right. Okay, great. That is right. And now we have that answer. So the next one is, um, what is the name of the service used by port 6666? And we're going to search through the connect or con path again and it is going to be a uh, very kind of a similar type of a, well, let me, instead of deleting everything, I'm just gonna delete the top of that at least. And uh, we're gonna cut the ID of the responding port and then the service, and we're gonna sort it, whoops, and unique count and sort our, whoops, count, and let's see what that brings for us. So it says, what is the name of the service used by port 6666? 
So this is the base search command. And so what we want to do is we want to just change everything after this. And we want to just do 6666. What am I doing, buddy? Come on. 6666. Too many sixes. There's not any of this. There we go. Uh, the service is IRC. That is the name of the service. So we cut the ID of the responding port. That's what we cut. And we cut service just to be able to find the actual service. And then we sorted it. Unique port 6666. So IRC. That is what we did. And so what is the amount of transfer total bytes to 101, 235 on port 8888? So we're going to use a previous query that uh, was pretty useful before. And then we're going to modify it to add what we need to add so that we can actually get the final results for ourselves. So the filter that we're going to use or the query that we're going to use is going to be the connection received data. And we're going to just modify certain pieces right here. So we're going to cut out all of this extra stuff right here, everything before total bytes. And we're going to add, uh, can I just type like that? Okay, type ID respond, whoops, responding host and ID responding port. And we are going to then at the very least, we're going to add the sort and unique and all that good stuff to finalize it. So sort unique, and we need to search for 101, 201, 172, 235, as well as 88, 88. Oh, whoops, I should not be using that. I should be using that. And total bytes is right here. So 3729. 3729. Use a comma. Make sure to use the comma because apparently that comma is crucial. That's <laughs> so funny. It's so funny that the comma is like the big deal in that situation. Um, so now we need to go ahead and use one of the, the queries that they gave us before, which is this thing to find the MITRE attack ID. So we're going to end up using that as our base query. And then we're just going to modify it a little bit to make sure that it actually works the way that we want it to. So the specific thing that we're interested in is the tactic, because that's what they're asking for is the tactic. So we're going to use this specific part of the filter. So we're going to do the event type alert, and then we're going to use this part that has to do with the MITRE tactic, but then we're just going to change it from tactic name to tactic ID, and then we're going to sort, and then we're going to unique, and it should give us exactly what we need. So I'm going to just copy this part right here. And usually when I do this, I have to copy it twice for whatever reason, it won't paste it in here. So I'm going to copy it again, and we're going to come back and we're going to paste it in here. Okay, very good. So we got that. And then what we want is the other portion. Hopefully it'll let me actually do this. So I'm going to take this and we're going to copy that and please paste it. Please paste it. Okay, very good. It pasted that. So now I'm just going to change the last part to ID because we don't want the name. We want the ID. And then we're just going to sort and we're going to look for unique. And it should give us some kind of data here. I forgot to put cut, my bad. So we're going to put cut over there. There you go. So we got it. So event type alert, cut, the metadata ID, sort, unique, and this is it, TA0040. And that should be it. Oh, I don't think we need this. So we need to get rid of those and submit that. And that is indeed the answer. So this is actually super useful. This tool is very useful, especially when you learn how to mess around with these queries and how to search through everything. And they give you a lot of pre-made filters, like beautiful pre-made filters. 
that you can kind of modify and mess with and uh, things like the connection receive data and then it kind of just shows you how to go through it and then cut from it right so it's just it's very very useful very very useful um, I highly recommend that if you're interested in defensive security, if you're interested in using Zeek or uh, uh, previously known as Bro or Snort or Wireshark or any of these types of services, I highly recommend you get good at these queries. Uh, this is going to be something that I'm going to revisit multiple times in the future because it's just it's super freaking useful. And honestly, it's very, very useful, especially for just searching and trying to find things. It might not be fully robust in the sense that you can find a lot of in-depth information or something like that but it's just extremely useful very easy to use there's a lot of pre-made queries that you can use and that's just always 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 helpful so um that was it for this room we're just gonna wrap it real quick and uh yeah i'll see you in the next one so the congratulations part this is it's very, it's like a very basic finished congratulations. There's no extra stuff. Um, there is, however, an invitation to go into the other room, which is the Brim Challenge Room for Masterminds. Uh, so if we go back to, where is it? I clicked on this twice, this thing right here. So there's the Masterminds Room that is for Brim, practicing analyzing malicious traffic using Brim. Uh, this seems like it might be a little bit out of my depth, so I don't think I'm going to jump into it right now, although I just might. I don't know. But I'm very, very happy that we were able to finish this. So if you don't have access to Try Hack Me, you can go ahead and get your subscription, and then you'll be able to use all of these amazing rooms with all of their amazing tools and uh, just get to hacking, get to analyzing and securing and all that good stuff. The link in the description below will give you a discount on your membership so that you can get instead of 12 bucks, it'll be seven bucks for you. And I mean, it's already super affordable anyway. So that's just one extra benefit for you to use it. And uh, if not, you can always just follow along with these videos and just download it on your own computer, which you're more than welcome to do. And if you want to do that, all you got to do is like, subscribe, and turn on that notification bell so that you get notified the next time that a video comes out. And then we can just kind of do the activities together and we can learn together and grow together and hack together and take over the world. It's your boy Hank Hackerson at Hank Hacks Hackers. I hope you found this video useful. I definitely did. I really, really love this freaking tool. So I think I'm going to try to get really good at it because it's going to be very useful for the future. And uh, yeah, if no one else loves you, Hank loves you. Peace, love, and chicken grease. I will see you in the next video. Later.